Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the school committee meeting tonight. It's August 18th, 2021. The time is 7.05, and all members are present with the exception of Mrs. Raffi. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, certain provisions of the open meeting law have been adjusted. The Holliston School Committee will be using remote participation for this meeting. The audio of this meeting is being recorded and will be posted to the HCAT webpage within 24 hours in accordance with the governor's emergency action requirement of keeping the public informed of actions during this meeting. I ask that all participants remotely attending this meeting, please state your name for identification purposes each time you speak throughout the meeting. At this time, a roll call attendance will be taking, taken. Ms. Gupta? Yes. Ms. Bigelow? Present. Ms. Koshin? Present. Ms. Dvorsky? Present. Dr. Savard? Present. Mrs. Lesevnik? Present. And as I said, Ms. Raffi is uh, absent today. At this time, I would entertain a motion to uh, for virtual participation, remote participation. Moved by Amanda. Seconded by Lisa. Moved by Amanda, seconded by Lisa. All in favor? Ms. Gupta? Yes. Ms. Bigelow? Yes. Ms. Koshin? Yes. Ms. Dvorsky? Yes. Dr. Savard? Yes. Mrs. Lestevnik? Yes. So uh, the first item on our agenda is uh, we have some minutes that we need to accept. Um, does anybody have any questions, comments, re revisions for the following school committee meeting minutes? I have October 20th, 2020, regular session, December 3rd, 2020, regular session, December 10th, 2020, regular session, and June 17th, 2021, regular session. Did you say October 20th or October 29th? I think that 20th. Yeah. Uh, nope. I have regular session meeting minutes of October 29th. Can you just double check? On my agenda, it says 20th. Maybe it was up. Was it updated from the time that I printed it? The ones that were provided to us in the packet say October 29th. So maybe pull that one for next week and have the agenda. Oh, I see it. It does say 29th. I'm going to just change it on my agenda. It was probably just updated and I didn't see it. Okay. So the October 29th, 2020. Okay. I would entertain a motion to accept the meetings from the following, from those meeting minutes, please. Moved by Don. Seconded by Minnie. Moved by Dawn, seconded by Minnie. All in favor? Ms. Gupta? Yes. Ms. Bigelow? Yes. Ms. Koshin? Yes. Ms. Navorsky? Yes. Dr. Savard? Yes. And Mrs. Lestevnik, yes. And now we'll move on to oral communications. Does anyone have any school committee individual comment to make tonight? No? Lisa? Yeah. Oh, I guess I should change my name on there. Sorry about that. Um, I So this may be something you're going to take up as chair, Cynthia, but I just wanted to make sure we're going to give some kind of update on the website that was purporting to be from the school committee that is, in fact, not from the school committee. Were you going to address that, or can I just say a few words about that really quickly? You can go ahead. Okay. So I just... Um, I guess apologies to the community that we still haven't resolved this, but it's trickier than you would think. Um, there's a website that was purporting to be from the Holston School Committee um, that was addressing critical race theory and um, throwing out a bunch of language, trying to scare people into thinking that we were going to, um, you know, be shaming children for being white and things of that nature. Um, I just want to say a few things on this. I know that um, I was going to talk about this when we get to the newsletter, but I was hoping that we could address this further in our newsletter for next week. That's what I was going to propose. But in the meantime, I just wanted to make a statement about it that, you know, this, when people come across, people are going to continue coming across this website because I continue to get comments about it. And um, it's not in any way affiliated with us or with Diverse Holliston, which is a grassroots organization working for 
um, diversity, equity, and, and inclusion community-wide. Um, I, I'm confused by the information on there because I've been working on these issues for two years, and I had not heard the term critical race theory until um, people who are worried about us making changes started throwing it around. And I had to Google it and basically found out it's an academic phrase that um, is being used to scare people into thinking that somehow we're going to um, be teaching objectionable material. The reality is that, you know, we've been talking about more diverse hiring, diversifying the curriculum, and um, you know, widening the lens on professional development for a couple of years now. None of that is going to happen overnight, but it certainly became more important after, you know, or more, it, it, it became, it, it got pushed to the forefront by um, George Floyd's murder and obviously all the, the, the news stories that we saw, that we all saw um, over the course of the last year and during the pandemic. Um, but I don't want people to think that you know, any of this is happening in a vacuum. Um, we haven't, you know, there are parts of our curriculum that haven't, you know, haven't been updated in a very long time. Um, and, you know, I did not learn about the Tulsa race massacre until a few months ago. So the whole point of asking these questions and looking at these issues is to make sure that we're serving our children and teaching them in, during their pre-K to 12 experience, the basic things they need to know to go out into the world as educated people. So, you know, there's no conspiracy to, you know, sneak in some, you know, liberal agenda into the curriculum. And I think people are really um, freaking out about things that they just don't understand. And part of that is on us. We need to communicate better what we're doing and why, but, um, you know, this, this, any changes that are made are going to be done by professional educators in a professional way. And I hope that we're able to get this website. We've, we have lawyers and, and, uh, IT people working on it. And I really hope we're able to get this website taken down soon. But in the meantime, I just want people to know that we are working on communicating this better. Um, we've just kind of had our heads wrapped up in the Delta variant for the last couple of months. And um, I just really regret that these sort of scare tactics and fear mongering um, have made their way onto Facebook and bumper stickers and out into the community. And I hope that we're able to communicate it, communicate on it better going forward. Thank you. Anyone else have anything? Okay, I, I have one thing. Um, I just want to publicly thank the ARPA steering group and the select board for approving uh, these funds to support free full day kindergarten, which is a huge step forward for our district. And it really represents a true partnership between the tri boards. And I just wanted to thank them publicly for that. Okay, central office comment. Oh, sorry, Keith, go ahead. I just wanted to give a quick update because I'm sure as many of you have noticed, um, we don't have green where committee and field used to be. Um, the, the project has obviously started in earnest. Um, there's been an unfortunate delay um, due to availability of material and um, with some of the weather that we've been having in the Northeast with the rain, because they can't, in some of the rainstorms, they've just fallen behind on their schedule. So whereas they were scheduled to be finished next week, um, early next week, it's now been pushed back. They're, they're shooting for 9-1. I'm going to hope that it's 9-3 because I know we have some rain coming again this week. So, um, but I've made weekends, nights, whatever they need to be available to get this done as quickly as possible. But I just want to give you an update on that. So, Thank you, Keith. Amanda? This is just a follow up to Keith. Keith, we're not going to be able to get any sort of discount, are we? No, I mean, it's, you know, in theory, there's a penalty clause in there, um, but there's a force majeure as well in there. So it's, you know, th this, this is something that they couldn't help, especially the weather piece. That's, you know, it's clear that, you know, they, there's nothing they could do about that. And that was the major thing. Um, they, they had moved the, the install date back from, 
the 20th to the 23rd um, based on the material being available. But it's, like I said, now it's weather that's pushed it back. So, um, but we're way under budget already in all honesty. So I'm, I'm, we're in good shape, so. Okay. Dr. Casca? Hi, I'm actually on my phone. I'm having oh, okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. And there's noise outside, too. Um, <laughs> I wanted to say, I wanted to echo what you were saying about full day K. That is a great step in the right direction for our equity journey that we're trying to make positive educational, equitable experiences for all our children. And it starts in early literacy and literacy development. So I also wanted to take a moment to introduce and I'm very sorry about that loud noise outside. Um, I want to take a moment to introduce our new director of SBL and Equity, Jari Alvernay. He is here, and I would like him to give a few minutes to explain a little bit about his background. And I know we're very excited to have him join our district, and he's hit the ground running as of July 19th when he joined us, and I'm really happy to have him on our team. So, Jari Hello, everyone. Um, just want to say thank you for having me here tonight. Um, also, I'd just like to say thank you to the Holliston community. I've been um, welcomed with open arms um, and well-received, so just thank you so much. You guys have a special community in Holliston. Just wanted to uh, share a little bit about myself. Um, I come from a background of educators. Both of my parents were school counselors. My wife's a classroom teacher, um, and I just have, I, I just love working in our schools. I began uh, in education about 16 years ago as a school adjustment counselor and a mental health clinic, a mental health clinician in the Brockton Public Schools. My background is clinical social work, um, and I, I just love working with students, community members, and in, in, in educators to just support all of our students as much as possible. I transitioned to the New Bedford Schools, uh, where I was a school-based leader, uh, and then I became a district leader as a director wraparound services, where I worked with amazing leaders in New Bedford to think about how to create systems of support for all students. Um, and I'm just so excited to be a part of the Holliston Public Schools. Um, I'm excited about our journey and where we're headed, um, where we're really going to be thinking about how to create safe and supportive schools for all students, all staff, where all community members feel welcomed. Um, and it's really about just making sure the students have a wonderful time that they experience joy um, as part of our school system. And how do we make sure that that happens for our students? Um, so that's part of the journey. Um, and I just wanna say thank you so much. I'm passionate about this work. I look forward to working with each of you in some way. Um, and I look forward to the years together. Thank you. Thank you, Jeriel. Welcome, welcome. Um, I'm Cynthia Stefan. We've already met before a couple times already. And I was just wondering if the rest of the school committee wanted to just say a couple of words, maybe just um, say who you are and kids in the district and uh, how long you've been on the committee. Minnie, do you want to start? Hi, Jerry. Welcome. Welcome to Holliston. Um, and thank you for joining us. And I'm hoping that you will have a great time with us. I just joined as a part of the school committee. I was elected in May. And so far, it's been a pleasure. We have wonderful people here. And trust me, if you have received messages welcoming you, they are from the heart. But if you have received anything other than that, it's my new school. There's a great community. And I am really hoping that you'll have a great time here. And welcome again. Thank you. Amanda? Hi, Jerry. Al. We've met before, too. So you remember I'm the other one that just joined. Um, I have two kids in uh, Miller and Adams, and I'm a high school math teacher. And I'm going to echo what Minnie said. We're so lucky to have you, um, your experience, your personality. Um, I'm really looking forward to working on several initiatives with you and um, supporting you in your journey. Welcome. Thank you so much. Lisa. Hi, Jeriel. We met as well. I'm Lisa Koshin, and I have one child in the district going into middle school, and this is my uh, now seventh year on the school committee. We're so happy you're here. Welcome. Thank you. Hi, Jeriel. 
Hi, Jerry. We met briefly. Um, my name is Don Naborski. I have five kids in the district. I'm an attorney and I'm uh, entering my third year as a school committee member and welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Catherine? Hi, Jerry. I'm the only one that has not met you and I'm so sorry about that. Um, but I come from a similar background as you. I am from the world of social work um, and a family full of teachers. I actually grew up in Middleborough, so I know Brockton well, and my family is all from New Bedford. So I'm familiar with all your, <laughs> all your areas and spaces. So I look forward to meeting you. Welcome. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Very well, thank you so much, Jerrielle. We look forward to great things in the future. Dr. Kaska, do you have any other um, uh, any other comment? Uh, can I quickly ask a question? Uh, yeah, I did, I was gonna, I yeah, do. Yeah, to okay. yeah, do. Go ahead, Minnie. Dr. Susan. Um, so there's a there's a little bit of a confusion. We are starting full K. So if uh, Susan, if you could just elaborate a little bit when we are starting, how the enrollment is proceeding, and all that, that would be great. Thank you. Yes. And I knew it was a rigorous timeline, but knowing that we had the opera money and the opera meetings, uh, very just the last couple of weeks we've had opera meetings. So I took the opportunity to put in the proposal to use opera funds to see if we could get full day K up and running because it is a dire need in the community. As I mentioned, we were one of 31 communities this year, and now it's only 30 communities that will not be paying for full day K this year. And it is for the 21 22 school year. So any parent, that has already put money down towards their tuition will be refunded. I cannot promise them that it's going to come to them immediately just because we have to go through treasury. It takes time to work out those refunds, but they will get the money this fall. I know that Mr. Boudet is working on that already, but it's, it's really a huge step forward for our community as a school community with our work on equity. So I'm very excited about that. And yes, it does start in September. Refunded full, full day K. It's very exciting. It's been a long time coming. Okay, seeing no other comments, I'm gonna move on to, we do have public comment this evening. Um, I have six people registered for public comment uh, ahead of time. And um, I just wanted to let you know that we have, we're gonna offer people two minutes um, for their public comment. Um, we have a maximum time period for this to this evening of 30 minutes. So I have six people registered. If there's more people that can come in after those six people, then I'm, Happy to entertain that, but we have a 30 minute window for our public comment this evening. Typically we have a 15 minute window for um, public comment. So we'll move right ahead. Mr. Boudet, do you want to let on, let on our first person, please? Sure. Um, it's, I, I uh, oops, I clicked somebody there. Chris Snapper, could you please uh, provide your name and address for the record? And then you have your two minutes. Chris, you're muted. Hello, everyone. Um, sorry, I think there was a delay. I was watching it on Facebook. Um, That's okay. Go uh, right Chris ahead. Uh, Chris Kadoper, uh, Holliston, uh, and I'm a parent uh, of two children in the district. Um, I just wanted to say a little bit about the uh, face coverings policy. Uh, I read the district's proposal for face coverings today. I stand behind it fully. Uh, I understand I am sympathetic and am sympathetic to the emotional whiplash the community feels about masking after having gotten the vaccine in hopes that we would be, able, be in a place to start the school year without masks. Fortunately, we are not there and this is not possible. I commend the district and the board for putting student and state staff safety first and implementing universal masking. I would like to make two key points as to why their universal mask policy is the right choice. First, vaccination does not entirely prevent the spread of COVID. And second, the Delta variant appears to be more dangerous to kids than the strain we were dealing with last year. In regards to vaccination, the vaccines are still providing great protection from severe illness and death, but are not providing robust protection from infection and don't prevent the spread of the Delta to others. Because, of vac because vaccinated people can spread the virus to others, no one, no matter their vaccination status, should be inside the school without a mask. Considering the risk to kids, children contracting long COVID is not as rare as one would hope. And the rate of children with COVID needing hospitalization is on the rise nationwide. Two studies from the UK before, before Delta variant 
with the less infectious variant cited long COVID rates of nearly one in 10 kids who are infected and the other study was one in 25 kids. In my own family, we have a niece with long COVID, still struggling with the symptoms and a young cousin who spent time in the pediatric ICU last year with MISC, the inflammatory syndrome caused by COVID. I support the, and commend Holliston for following the guidance of the CDC and the American Academy of Pediatrics. The Massachusetts Teachers Association supports universal masking, and I am pleased that as a district, we are respecting the teacher's wishes. The district must provide a safe place for all students to learn. I am appreciative of the district, or appreciative that the district is listening to the health experts by implementing mandatory masking for students and staff, and in so doing, putting the health of my family, friends, and members of my community as a top priority. We are paying attention to the science and medical experts, and I'm, I am supportive of this guidance. I did have two questions um, about one about the proposal. Um, there's a, a proposed policy that unvac unvaccinated people remain three feet. Um, distance when unmasked indoors. Can you clarify that these clarify these circumstances when this would be the case and how they might differ from vaccinated individuals? Um, also, uh, is there gonna be any update or have there been any updates to the ventilation in the schools? Uh, that is all, thank you so much. So Chris, just to let you know, we don't generally respond back to public comment, but um, we will take, when, we, when Dr. Kuska does her update, um, about uh, start of school. And when we talk about the mask policy, which is up next, we'll try to address those in there. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your comment. Keith, who's up next? Um, it'll be Leah Daniels, she's on the phone. Okay. Leah, go right ahead. Leah, you are muted. Leah, you're muted. Um, please give your name and address for the record. Leah, uh, Leah, I'm going to put you back. I'm going to. I'll leave you here, People Leah. People have to press star six to unmute on a phone. Okay. Did you? Oh, there we go. Are you on, Leah? I'm on. Can you hear me now? Yes. Sorry, I wasn't aware I had to press star six. Are you on, Leah? I'm on. Can you hear me? Yes. Sorry, I wasn't aware I had to press star six. Are you on, Leah? Leah, you're going to want to move away or turn off whatever the yep. background you're listening to. It's you guys. I apologize. <laughs> uh, my, name, my name is Leah Daniels. I uh, live here in Holliston, and I do have a student uh, in the Miller school system. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to speak uh, with all of you tonight. Uh, I, I want to start by saying uh, we had a tremendous year last year, and I was very impressed, as I'm sure many of the fellow community members, with uh, the school and all of your effort to get our little ones into school five days a week and one of the only school districts to have pulled off that tremendous feat and to have done so successfully and so well. Um, obviously that's a great place for us to start and a blueprint on how we can proceed forward in the next year. Um, I also had the opportunity to read through our policy plans for this year and I agree with the decisions that have been or the suggestions that have been put forth by Dr. Kuska and the school board. Um, I would like to also mention that we have a tremendous benefit as part of a, a school system that starts later in uh, the school year. And we have seen what's happened in some of the other school systems, such as Hillsborough, Florida, where 5% of the students and faculty are already quarantined five days into school. That's the seventh largest school district here in the United States um, with 200 thousand students and um, over 10,000 of them have already been quarantined. That's five days in. In Texas, we've seen the Iran Sheffield school system already moved to virtual learning less than two weeks into the school year um, with 100% of the students moving to virtual for the next two weeks and potentially longer. As we get closer to home, we've seen our Boston University's, the number of 
students um, that they bring into uh, our cities and they've made the decision that indoor masking policy is going to be mandatory. And we even see other school districts like Needham with a high vaccination rate of 95% choosing to go with a mandatory indoor masking policy. Um, for me, this is all about creating a safe learning space for our students and without the, that sort of structure where you can uh, look around and police 100% that everyone is being safe, I can't possibly imagine how we could go forward with a um, optional mask policy or some of the other solutions that we have seen um, floating around. So I just would like to mention and, and state that for me, the this opportunity to keep all of our students safe and learning is primary, and I appreciate all of the effort that you guys are making to help make that a reality. Thank you. Thank you, Leah, for your comment. Keith, who's up next? Um, I'm, I, I have two people I can't find in the waiting room, so I'm trying to email with them right now. We're gonna jump over to Carla Alfred next. Let me just admit her. Back to the waiting room. Hello. Hi, Carla. Can uh, you just state your name and your address, please? Carla Alfred, three fifteen High Street. Um, there's a lot of connection problems. Hold on. I can hear you, but you're a little bit quiet. Okay. You could just. Put your volume up a little bit. Get really close. Thank you for hearing me tonight. I have a statement to read to the Holliston School Committee to be entered into the record as public comment at the school committee meeting on August 18th. We, the undersigned community members of Holliston, would like to voice our support for the school committee's drafted policy entitled Face Coverings, EBCFA. We fully support a universal mask requirement for grades K through 12 at Holliston Public Schools. Masks are a simple, effective safety measure that we have at our disposal to protect our children from COVID-19. Both the CDC and the American Academy of Pediatrics have recommended universal masking for K-12. With the highly transmissible Delta variant spreading, COVID cases on the rise in Holliston, and with the new information that vaccinated people can readily spread this virus, it is clear that masks are needed to keep our children safe as they return to school this fall. It is also clear that we have an opportunity to teach our children a sense of community responsibility and caring with a mask mandate, that we wear a mask to protect our friends, classmates, teachers, and family. The importance of this lesson, that we are all in this together, cannot be understated. We urge you to vote yes on this policy and continue your tireless work in creating a safe and healthy learning environment for our children. Thank you. Signed, Alicia Thomas, Jason Thomas, Jessica Kirchner, Emily Knopp, Dan Knopp, Jennifer Dayton, Greg Dayton, Dana Belgeco, Laura Sowiski, Pat Sowiski, Bethany Hart Geary, Jillian McCauley, Jesse Brower, Matt Brower, Robert Prince, Prince, sorry, Robert, Rob Kills Mecco, Carrie Clems Mecco, Andrew Johnson, Meg Johnson, Chris Carson, Christy Carson, Jane Cahoot, Danielle Charlotte, Barb Bitts Warby, and Dan and Carla Alfred. Thanks very much, Carla, for your comment. Okay, Keith, who's next? I'm just working on some identification issues. I think we have to be able to jump. Uh, 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 Dan, who was going to speak, has emailed me and he's passing. Okay. So I think I have the other two people. I don't know who they are on the list because they did. I don't have their names. Um, here. I had. Um, a uh, James Drummy? No, no, I, I'm saying he's not in the waiting room. He's not oh. I don't have him on the waiting room. So I'm emailing with him right now to get him okay. there. And the same thing with Susan Rose. I don't have a Susan Rose in the waiting room. I do have a Susan, but I don't know if it's Susan Rose. So um so you could grab you could tell me who to grab from the waiting room. I don't pick pick an order, top to bottom, bottom to top, random. Uh, um just grab somebody, I guess. Okay, we'll grab uh I, I don't like when people don't put their name down. I know. Um, um, this person's in. This person's in twice. We'll go with that person. Jim Jansen. 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 Okay. I wasn't a school. Wasn't a school teacher. I can't do other people's names apparently. So, Carla out. 
Jim, you're in the school committee meeting. Please give your full name and address, please, for the record. Jim, are you there? Jim Jansen, are you there? I think the audio is not connected. Okay, I'm moving back to the waiting room. Okay. And okay, we'll choose somebody further down the list. Let's try Lisa Bart Barton Bartman is that. Can't do this. So if you can give your name, I since I can't apparently pronounce it. And uh, <laughs> okay, um, Lisa, can you unmute? Please just state your name and your address for the record, please, and you can proceed with your comment. Sorry, I'm, I'm just unmuting. Actually, um, I, I was just listening in, so so no need, no no comments for me. But I'm 100 in agreement with masking. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks, Lisa. Okay, go to the top of the list, and let's go grab this person, Dave's phone. I'll try that. Oh, Dave's phone moved. There it is. Is it just my computer that's slow or is that theirs? Is no, just it's, it's, that's him. That's not you. Okay. Okay, we're going to put him back in the waiting room. Okay. Oh, wait. Uh, no. Put him back in the waiting room. <laughs> um, I have somebody else on the phone if you want to go to that. Sure, go ahead. So we'll try that next. This piece of it has not worked out well. Um, that's okay. Number 781-710-8168. Please uh, provide your name and address. Star six, right? Star Dr. six, to, uh, Star to, six unmute. to unmute, please. There you go. Hi, please state your name and your address, please, for the record. And then you can have your comment. Hi, my name is Bud Drummy, uh, Mitchell Road. I have three children in the, in the school district here. It, it seems as, as if this is uh, essentially a, a foregone conclusion at this point based on all of the DESC and the, and the policy as written today. So I, I personally think that, that the masks ought to be a choice based on the vaccination rates, but it, you know, it, it clearly is uh, not looking as if that is going to go that way. So what I, have, what I would like to do is to, is to make a, re, a few requests. So I would like the, to, or to have the school committee just ensure that we continue to be objective. We continue to share data. And in addition to sharing data, I would like to get a better understanding of how the school committee is interpreting data and studies. For example, in the, uh, in the document that was attached today, there, was, there were links to studies, but I would appreciate getting some, uh, some summary or, or some conclusions that the school committee is drawing from these studies to support the decisions. It's, it's, it's one thing to point to the data or the, stu or the study rather, but I'd, I'd like to get uh, a little bit more information on sort of the, the inner workings and, and what the thought process is. And then lastly, what, what's probably most important to me is that we stay flexible and responsive on this. Things are changing very quickly. And, and, and I'd, I'd like to make sure that we have a, a regular process for reviewing the status that we're at and at such time that we're able to remove the, the requirement, we're able to do that. And, and it's, I, I think at, at this point, it's, it, again, it seems as if it's a foregone conclusion. And uh, I think it's unfortunate that, it, that it's heading that way. I'm, I'm not so sure that all of the, the studies and, and conclusions are, are objective, but nonetheless, it seems as if it's going that way. So I would just appreciate if we could continue to keep this discussion going and make sure that uh, we're reviewing on a regular basis and in, in the event that we're able to remove the requirement, we can. Thanks for your time. Thanks for your comment. All right, Keith, who's up next? Okay, put him back in the waiting room. Uh, let's grab somebody from the middle. Uh, <clears throat> we did the iPhone, Jim Jansen failed. Uh, let's try John S. 
Okay, John S. You're oh, there. We go. Well, he's not connected yet. It's close. What's up with the slow audios tonight? If people aren't paying attention, they can't. You know, they they their machine. Oh, I see. Them. If they're watching right. something on Facebook or elsewhere, right. okay, that makes sense. John, if you could unmute yourself and provide your name and address. Yeah, my name is John Sakara with 10 Dixon Circle. Uh, I agree with previous caller. I'm against the required face masks. Uh, I'm an engineer. We uh, analyze facilities for schools and other buildings, and it's we, we engineer systems to increase oxygen levels for brain functionality and for education purposes. Sticking a mask on kids throughout schools, it completely reduces oxygen levels uh, in their intake. I know I suffer from it throughout the day if I have to wear a mask. And uh, I, I think it should be objectionable for whoever thinks they need it and not require a cross. And again, I don't think this is really discussion since the teams were telling that it's going to be required. So I thought if this was going to be more of a voting uh, scenario and not just be told that we're going to be wearing masks and data for it. Uh, another topic, I think the information where to find this was very difficult to acquire. And uh, the pre registration for comments, the website to view this, it was very difficult to find. And I, by the numbers of who's watching this, it seems like many others probably didn't have this information as well. So I think some better information come across to where we can find the videos and to. Uh, to interact uh, would be helpful if it was shared a little bit more easily, straightforward. Thank you. Thanks for your comment, John. Okay. Uh, oops. First, I was going to try next. Is not here now. Um, uh, did her? That's John S. Thank you. Um, okay, going to do this. A McCoy. Hey, McCoy, please unmute yourself and provide your name and address, please, for the record. Hello, Andrea McCoy, 96 Church Street. Hi, go ahead with your comment, please. Oh, I don't, I don't have a comment. I oh, just... all right. <laughs> okay. Okay, we can put her back. Okay, well, we'll work down from there. We have a Bob Nemet. Um, who is next? If you can unmute yourself and give your name and address. Bob, you can give your name and address. Bob, can you give your name and address and then you can have your comment? Nope. Yep. Okay, he's gone. He did that to himself. Um, I have a Brittany next. Brittany, if you can give your name and address and then make your comment, you have to unmute. Okay, sorry, can you hear me okay? Yes, yep. go ahead, Brittany, with your comment. Just your name or address, okay. please. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you. So first off, uh, thank you to the teachers and the staff for this past 17 months during this pandemic. It's been a pretty scary time. Um, her, we've been able to learn a ton about how this virus impacts our children. Massachusetts is the third highest vaccination rate in the U.S. for the New York Times and many other news articles out there. It's time for our kids to start experiencing some normalcy. This is not their burden to bear. In fact, many kids have gone most of the summer not having to wear a mask at this time. Governor Baker recently announced that masks are not mandatory for these kids in schools. Yesterday, NBC Boston stated that Baker has advised masks indoors only for those at higher risk for COVID-19 or those who live with an adult that is unvaccinated or at a higher risk from the virus. Um, 
you know, if, if you or a parent truly feel that masks are helping to prevent this virus, it needs to be a patient, or I'm sorry, a parent decision. Um, you know, in the example of an unmasked child was playing with a masked child, and if you truly believe that these masks are keeping your children safe, then that's, you know, a parent decision. You know, if they're putting their, quote, you know, kid at risk, that's their own decision. Um, you know, the flu has had more of a negative impact on kids than COVID-19 in regards to deaths, and we've not worn masks with the flu virus. So, you know, and there's been more of a negative impact in regarding social and emotional issues. I've had my kids come home, you know, just crying that they have to wear a mask. And, um, you know, overall, I, I am thankful for this opportunity to speak and stand up for my child. I know it is a gift and it's not, you know, not everybody has this opportunity. In the end, we should not be using this as a topic to divide us. I do want to make that point, though. You know, it's the last thing that this world needs. I'm passionate about these kids growing up the way that we did, being able to see each other's faces and having normalcy. It's time that we stand up for our kids and let masks be a choice. Thanks for your comment, Brittany. Okay. Got a few um, more minutes, Keith, and that's it. Okay, I'm gonna try Susan again. She's back here now. This may be the Susan who we're missing, so we'll find out. Susan, if you can unmute and provide your name and address, please. You're muted. Susan, if you can unmute and provide your name and address, please. Yep, Susan Rose, 45 Exchange Street, Holliston. You're muted. Am I still? Can you please just turn off the background noise? You have the TV or something on the background and it's Street delaying. Sorry, I had the, uh, the meeting on the phone. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Uh, my name's Susan and I'm a parent of an incoming kindergartner and thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. We're Can you military your address please for the record? Yep, it's 45 Exchange Street in Holliston. Thank you. Yep. Um, we're a military family and my husband has served in the United States Navy for over 20 years. We believe in freedom and we are extraordinarily fortunate and grateful to have the United States Constitution to protect our freedom. But freedom is not free, freedom is fought for. And if we don't fight for our freedom now, we will no longer be free. I'm here tonight to fight for my daughter's freedom. Her freedom is protected by the First Amendment of the United States Constitution, where she and all Americans are guaranteed freedom of speech and freedom of expression without censorship, interference, and restraint. If my five-year-old daughter were to wear a mask at school this fall, it would absolutely interfere with her ability to breathe, communicate, and express herself, which is why I encourage you to make masks optional this year. Facial expressions are integral in human connection, especially for young children who are learning how to signal fear, confusion, sadness, excitement, and happiness. Covering a child's face mutes these nonverbal forms of communication and can result in emotionless interactions, anxiety, and depression. Seeing people speak is a building block of phonetic development. My daughter keeps asking if she will have to wear a mask when she goes to kindergarten. This is one of the most exciting days of her whole life, and instead of worrying about which Anna and Elsa dress she'll have to wear or who she'll sit with at lunch, her concern is if she will have to wear a mask. It's been a very, very, very long two weeks to flatten the curve. Remember when that was the guidance? We've locked down, we've social distanced, and we've worn masks. We've missed out on weddings, funerals, and birthday parties. We've done everything we've been told to do. When all the while we've stopped living. When do we start living again? Ms. Kuska, you spoke last night recommending we start the school year with masks. And when the Delta variant goes away, then maybe we can reassess and lift mask policy. Do you really think that the variants end with the Delta variant, there are a lot of letters in the Greek alphabet, and I'm pretty certain that the variants won't end there. So where do they end? You said yourself that the guidance is always changing, and if it's always changing, how do we know we're doing what's in the best interest of our children? If there's one thing that the children thrive on, it's consistency and policies that are constantly changing or anything but consistent. I understand you're following the guidance, but when the guidance is changing every five minutes, maybe we need to look at better alternatives. And I think it's important to emphasize that guidance as it's defined is advice and information to solve a problem. What exactly is the problem? In the last 18 month, we've, months, we've had approximately zero children in Holliston who have succumbed to the COVID-19 virus. 
Why are we implementing protocols for a non-existing problem? In fact, I'd argue we're actually creating a bigger problem by implementing policies that reduce their happiness. Research shows that happiness reduces your risk for developing colds and viruses such as COVID-19. The least happy people are three times more likely to develop colds and viruses compared to their happier counterparts. I'm grateful to, the, to have leaders in this country and state who are excited to go back to normal and who aren't afraid to go maskless. I've loved seeing our senators and representatives these last couple of weeks doing what they do best, contributing and participating in our communities, indoors and out, even hug, hugging constituents without a mask. So let's assume our leadership has all been vaccinated. Are they less likely to spread COVID, contract COVID? We were promised that once we were vaccinated, we could take off our masks and go back to normal. Ms. Kuska mentioned last night, and the CDC confirms that it's, it, it turns out that those who have been vaccinated can spread and contract COVID. So if the, vaccinate, if the vaccinated can spread COVID, then why are we singling out the unvaccinated in middle school and high school to be masked? Let's circle back to the definition of guidance. Guidance is advice and information aimed at resolving a problem or difficulty based on the and based on the discussion last night, and the guidance from the Department of Early Childhood Education, Education says we should mask our unvaccinated children. It doesn't make any sense. Other Massachusetts towns working with the same gui guidance as Holliston have decided on a mask optional policy this fall. Let's follow their leadership and do what's in the best interest of our children. Children are least likely to contract or spread COVID. Our senators and representatives are leading by example. And if they can go maskless, so can our children. I won't allow fear to conquer me and my family. My smile on my daughter's face is a gift and I choose to share it with people. She's my child, an extension of me, and I choose what goes in and on her body. My child, my choice, make masks optional. And Ms. Kuska, I encourage you and all of the school committee members to read the Constitution of the United States as I have purchased a copy and I will bring it by your office tomorrow. And I also have, um, you know, pictures of our leaders here, unmasked. These are our representatives. Hugging. Ms. Roush. Shaking hands. And if you go on Facebook pages, you know, you'll see many more, um, you know, they think that we can go back to normal and I'm ready to go back to normal. Um, you know, those pictures were taken in the last couple of weeks and I have this picture here. This is my daughter with her friends. And it seems that, you know, this is okay. okay. And this is okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, but Mr. Rose. Okay. Thank you. We've, we've exceeded the time. Okay, I appreciate your comment. You extra time. Thank you. Okay, and with that, I am going to close public comment. Okay. All right. Um, we're now going to move on to policy. So I am going to ask Dr. Savard to uh, please bring up policy EBCFA for discussion, actually for a reading and discussion. Hey, Cynthia, could you just take a moment before she does that since we had some, I think there was some misperceptions voiced in the public comment. Could you just explain our process, that how our process works? Because I think a lot of people watching probably don't know the process for adopting policies. Process for adopting policies. Okay, so first of all, this is a policy um, that we're discussing tonight. It's a policy that we actually had in place last year um, in response to the COVID-19 uh, virus. And um, we are just revising this policy. Uh, we had rescinded it back in the spring uh, in, uh, in light of changes in uh, the environment that we were living in. And typically when we have a policy, we have a first reading and then we have comments and discussion. And then we have a second reading uh, where we have an opportunity to discuss again and then vote. Um, we usually, oftentimes we will, we have a, we can have a third reading, but oftentimes we, we um, waive the third reading and adopt the policy. Now, since this is a previous policy we already have, we don't necessarily have to do uh, the two readings. We just felt that that was the right thing to do as we as we move forward in the discussions. 
Okay. So, uh, Dr. Savard. So I have it here. Do you want me to just read it or do you want to share your screen so that people can see it or shall I just read it? Um, typically we just read it. So we did actually share out that draft policy to the community. So probably be easier for them to see it at home printed okay. than on a tiny screen. All right, here we go, it's lengthy. The Halston Public School Committee is committed, sorry, uh, this is um, face coverings policy, E-B-C-F-A. The Halston Public School is committed to, to providing a safe environment as schools reopen during the COVID-19 pandemic. According to public health experts, one of the best ways to stop the spread of coronavirus and to keep members of our school community safe is the use of face masks or face coverings. Therefore, in accordance with the guidance from the Centers for Disease Control, the CDC, the Department of, of Elementary and Secondary Education, DESE, and the Massachusetts Department of Public Health, DPH, the following requirements are in place until further notice. An appropriate face cover covering can be disposable or reusable and must be clean, fully covering the nose and mouth and secure under the chin, must may be, may, sorry, be made with at least two layers of breathable mat material, fit snugly but comfortably against the side of the face and be secured with ties or ear loops. More tightly woven materials, such as, tight, such as cotton fabrics with high thread counts, are preferable, while elastic materials are not recommended due to the higher pore size and lower filtration efficiency. Citation Harvard 2020. Based on guidance from health authorities, neck gaiters, open chin triangle bandanas, and face coverings containing valves, mesh materials, or holes of any kind will not be considered appropriate. Further, face coverings are not required to be surgical masks or respirators, such as N95 masks. When school is in session, a face mask or, fa or covering that covers the nose and mouth must, must be worn by all individuals within school buildings, on school property, and on school trans transportation, even when physical distancing is observed. All students in grades pre preschool through 12 plus are expected to wear a face covering as described above. When school is not in session, the current current Ma Commonwealth of Massachusetts regulations and CDC guidelines apply. Individuals may be excused from requirement for the following list of reasons per CDC guidance. The individual has trouble breathing, is unconscious, is incapacitated, cannot remove the mask or face covering without assistance. Furthermore, face mask or face coverings will not be required for anyone who has a medical, behavioral, or other challenge, making it unsafe to wear a face mask or face covering. A written note from a physician is required for a requested exemption. Parents may not excuse their child from face mask requirement by signing a waiver. Additionally, face masks or face covering are not required as noted below. During supervised mask breaks, when eating or drinking, during physical, physical education class that takes place outside at least 10 feet apart, during outdoor recess. Exceptions to this policy under certain circumstances, such as for students with medical, behavioral, or other challenges who are unable to wear masks, must be approved by the, by the building principal in consultation with the nurse or local board of health. Face shields or physical barriers may provide an alternative, may provide an alternative in some instances. A student's mask or face covering is to be provided by the student's parent or guardians. Staff members are responsible for their own face coverings. However, HPS will, will supply disposable face coverings for individuals who arrive at a building or school uh, or board school transportation without one. If students are in violation of this policy, the building principal will consult with the parent guardians to determine whether an exemption is appropriate or the student may be removed from the school building for in-person learning until such time as they can be, as, as they can comply with the requirement or the requirement is lifted. Violations of this policy by staff will be handled in the same manner as other, viol other violations of school committee policy. By visitors in violation of this policy will be denied entry into the school, school or district facility. This policy will remain in place until rescinded by the school committee. Do I need to read all the first reading, second reading stuff? No, you do not. Just the policy itself. <clears throat> I did want to clarify, I thought in, in the link that was provided, there were a few things were, that were struck through. 
um, including one, two, three paragraphs down, and this was just included in the reading, so I think it's important to clarify this. Three paragraphs down, it says all individuals when in school buildings. My understanding was strike on school property, and then you go back to and on school transportation. And the reason behind that, I assume, because this would not be a mask policy for outside. Is that correct? This is only a mask policy for inside the buildings and on transportation. Is that correct? Right. I think um, I'm wondering whether the policy, now that I'm looking at it, that she was reading is not the one that was put in our packet. I was just going to say, I'm reading the one from our packet. Yeah. Um, but I, I'm realizing now that our packet probably came before we Yeah, had, you can have one that has red strike throughs through it. So right. I, as you were doing that, I, I noted what we had to strike. And I think that right now, if you're okay with it, I can amend and, and, and fix it that way. Would that be helpful? Well, it's already, so it's in the correct one that um, Dr. Cuska just sent. If you're in your email, it's not, it, the one in our packet is not right. As I was reading it, I was realizing that it was the wrong one. Um, All right. But purposes of a reading, I just want to read aloud. Right. Paragraph three, strike when school is in session. Start with a face mask or face covering and you continue on. But to be clear, it's in school buildings and on school transportation. And we right. have stricken out on school property, right. meaning outside. Then last, uh, second to last sentence of paragraph three, we have uh, stricken out when school is not in session, current Commonwealth of Massachusetts regulations and CDC guidelines apply. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And it should and say, if alone in a closed room by oneself, a mask does not need to be worn. Sorry, go ahead, Keith. Just a quick question. I, I just want clarification. Are you saying that when school's not in session, masks don't have to be worn, or do you take that out? I, I, I we, heard it we removed, it was struck through when school is not in session. Right. So it's masked. It's masked twenty four seven. It's masked. It's sorry, masked twenty four seven in school. But the understanding when this policy, so I'm no longer on policy subcommittee, but when this was first enacted, and I know we used it as a template, the understanding behind the phrase when school's in session meant from the day our our staff starts in August or September until mm. it's over. We're not talking about school hours. We're not talking about, you know, bing, it's 810, put your mask on. Right. We're talking about the school period year of 21 to 22 or like the, the academic year. Yeah. Well, the, 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 academic re year. The, the reason that I'm asking is because, again, we do, we're, we're planning on, or, or I should, yeah, planning on uh, starting up the building use program again. And so I, I want to make sure I know what the expectations are. Um, before we go into that. And if it's that they're going to be wearing masks, which I support, um, then I just, I just want to make sure that that's exactly what you were written. So that's all. That okay. was our discussion last week, that that is why we took out when school is in session, because it's being, what we're saying right now, we're recommending that a face mask must be worn when in school buildings. So that we're, we're talking about for all purposes at this time, because we know that we're going to be looking at this in the weeks to come, but to start the, we have staff coming back already. We, we need them wearing masks. And, and as you said, we're going to have building use this year that we didn't have last year. So we're applying it. We're hoping to apply it for everyone right now, knowing that when we visit it, once school gets started. And that's why we struck the line about when school is not in session, because we're not, we're just saying it's going to be for all purposes when the building's being used at this time. Okay. And then the fourth paragraph, that one sentence says, individuals may temporarily uh, be excuse, uh, excused from the requirement for the following list of reasons per CDC guidance. I'm not sure the temporary part was read. Um, let's see. And then down below, additionally, face masks uh, on the first page at the last, um, last paragraph. Uh, additionally, fa face masks or face coverings are not required as noted below. And one says during physical ed education classes outside. So we struck through the that take place outside at least 10 feet apart. So as long as they're outside, we didn't put any parameters around spacing. And then there was also a um, underneath during outdoor recess, it was 
saying unvaccinated individuals must maintain at least three feet of distance inside when masked, when unmasked. So um, can we clarify that, that bullet a little bit, Susan? Yeah. I it's not a bullet. We need to can you hear me? Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, so the reason that that was added is because DESE has also, and DPH, has given us information about the stay and test protocol. And oh, what see. it says in there that individuals that are vaccinated, if they are exposed as a close contact to a positive individual and they're vaccinated, they can remain on campus if they're, un, if they're asymptomatic. And we would do the potentially do a test and stay protocol where they could get tested five days in a row. It does say, however, if you're unvaccinated and you were within three feet of an individual that was positive, then you have to, you would end up getting quarantined is how I read the guidance. And we're mm -hmm. still trying to clarify, just got that on Friday and I have our nurse leader working on that with other nurses in the con Commonwealth. But the way it's written, you would have to go home and quarantine if you were an unvaccinated individual and were within three feet unmasked inside. And that is why that was added in there for now. Okay. I guess I understood that as being um, what, during like lunch periods or something that they had to be at least three feet apart. Yes. If they're unmasked, so it will be during breaks and lunches. Okay. And we're still going to have them try to eat outside and have their mask breaks outside as much as possible. Um, I'll open it up for uh, questions, comments, thoughts. Amanda, go right ahead. And then Lisa. Um, thanks, Cynthia. So um, ultimately, I agree that the most important thing is keeping kids in school. If we go back to our public comment from earlier tonight, imagine that is the class that you're teaching, letting kids in from the waiting room and all that, right? That's, that's what school was like last year for some of us. That being said, um, I also want to offer the perspective that while I do agree that keeping everyone safe is number one, um, it is worth mentioning that there really are significant cons um, to having kids and teachers masks and masked in school. Um, if I'm wearing a mask in Target, it's a no-brainer. There's no downside, right? So in schools, um, I'm just concerned about kids who are have hearing. Uh, difficulties, according to the CDC, and I apologize, everyone, I did say this last night, um, I read that 15% of kids ages 6 to 19 have some sort of hearing loss. In addition, we have a large number of kids for whom English is not their first language at our school, um, and it's a lot harder to hear your teacher and to learn from your teacher when they are masked um, and you're not seeing their mouth move. So for learning, um, those students are at a disadvantage. Additionally, um, socially, right? In a group of kids wearing masks, it's harder to participate. The reason I bring this up um, is not because I'm against masks, I'm absolutely not, but um, it's worth mentioning that for these and other reasons, and this isn't my opinion, this is like from talking to parents and teachers in Halston, um, I think it might be worth us adding a procedure or discussing what our metrics are for removing this or for revisiting this, right? Um, I'm just trying to point out that I agree safety is the most important thing, but because of these cons, um, it's not just a no brainer that we'll permanently wear masks all the time. Um, so I guess as far as the document goes, could we discuss the, um, the criteria or a date for us re-looking at the data in town and you know, statewide, nationwide um, for rediscussing? Don? And, and I think that speaks to the gentleman caller that asked for us to be flexible and responsive. And I think that's absolutely part of what we can do. I think that part of this document includes, um, it says this policy will remain in place until revised or rescinded by the school committee. I'm not sure that we have to put it in the policy, but we could certainly have 
a commitment to have a set date. We could pick a date early October, mid-October to have another discussion and um, revisit it. We could include it on the agenda for every other school committee meeting. So that could be every two weeks, that could be every three weeks. But I think those are all, um, it, in my mind, it is, um, whether or not we have an upward or downward trend of COVID transmission, um, what we're, we're hearing about cases local um, and hospital availability, what, we're under, what our understanding is about the transmissibility, uh, the local positivity rate, I think those are, are all important factors. Um, I, I do think in terms of um, this specific policy, I want people to understand there is an exemption. It's a medical, behavioral, or other challenges. And, um, and in consultation, let's see, must be approved by the building principals in consultation with the school nurse or local board of health. So there, there are exceptions. And that I, I would be hopeful that the fact that we spent 170 plus days last year with 3,300 staff and students wearing masks and have found creative ways to mitigate that, that again, we could find creative ways to mitigate it. Um, you know, in, in terms of opening up the discussion, I, I think there is a common interest with every single person who called, the many people in the community who've written us, and I thank you for, for, um, for those letters and that input. Um, we have a common interest and there is no higher priority, I think, than having all of our students in the classroom with as minimal a disruption as we can make possible as we get through this next year. Um, and, and so I guess based on that, I wanted to look wanted to look, I guess, nationally, I wanted to look um, statewide, and I wanted to look locally. And I, I won't go on for long, but I do want to point out that the Mass Academy of Family Pediatricians described mask wearing as a public health measure proven to reduce the transmission of COVID and crucial full-time in-person learning with as little disruption as possible. Here in Holliston, just taking a look at our COVID dashboard from last year, we had, um, bear with me a second, um, over 100, I'm gonna say over 160 because I'm still looking for the number, cases of COVID last year. That was with masks and we had zero transmission in the schools. And that's what we wanna accomplish this year as well. Last year, up until April, we had half the number of students in a classroom and that's gonna change. We're going to have many more students in the classroom. They'll be one foot to three feet apart. Um, here in our school, we have a high school that is, and I always get this wrong, whether it's 40 or 50 or 60 years old, but we have rooms without windows. We have internal rooms where we have teachers um, who rotate through, see 20, 25 students per class, three sections of those and no windows. Uh, we have pregnant teachers. We have teachers with young unvaccinated um, uh, children of their own. I think we have to really consider the 400 staff members that come to school each day. We received a letter and just, I, I think it's important for people who have um, kids in the school um, to understand this. We received a letter from one of those teachers. And I know that Dr. Kuska had reached out to um, the Halston Federation Teachers Union representative to get their position on this and also um, to reach out to the paraprofessionals. And this is incredibly important because for 400 people are working there, there is no remote option. Um, this was a, uh, you know, I won't even disclose that, but a, an elementary school teacher who's writing to express her deep concern for the district's 21-22 plan that may make masks optional. And she asked that we mandate them. The plan to make masks optional goes against the guidance of both the CDC and the American Academy of Pediatrics, ignores the, COVID, the science on COVID transmission in kids and on the effectiveness of masks and fails to give our youngest kids who are not yet vaccine eligible, but will be soon, a chance to evade infection over, after over a year of sacrifice. Um, I want to talk about what's going on in our country. We have, um, we have states with universal mask mandates for K through 12. They include Illinois, Louisiana, New York, Connecticut, New Jersey, Delaware, Oregon, Washington, California, Hawaii, Virginia, the schools within the Washington DC district. There are K through 12 universal mask mandates for staff and for students. There are a variety of other states where they're leaving it up to individual school districts like Massachusetts. In fact, 
Montana said no mandate, but they'll defer to the CDC's recommendation of universal masking. That's Montana. The governor of Kentucky said, we cannot keep our kids in school if we are unwilling to put on a mask. The governor of North Carolina on a K through 12 mask mandate said, the science is clear that children learn better when they attend school in person. And the science is also clear that masks reduce COVID infections, so we keep them on. Um, as of this morning, there were 60 school districts within Massachusetts that had already enacted a mask mandate for K through 12. I do wanna point out, and I thought this was smart, um, Concord Carlisle, I believe it is, uh, already agreed to revisit this. I, and they set a, a time, um, something like two weeks or three weeks or four weeks to revisit. And I think that's important because we do hear you on the flexibility and the responsiveness to the conditions that are at hand. Um, the school districts that have already enacted this, Natick, Norwood, Weston, Wilmington, Sharon, Waltham, Westwood, Framingham, Concord, Concord, Carlisle, Andover, Belmont, Grafton, Boston, Burlington, Cambridge, Worcester. That's a snapshot. I could keep going. Um, I think that we need to look at what's going on here in Holliston. Um, here in Holliston, just want to grab my statistics on that. During the month of June of 2021, we had one case, one case. We, we had uh, folks vaccinated. We were wearing masks in the classroom. Uh, we were leaving for summer. We had one case. Um, so far, between August 1st to August 18th, we've had 27 cases in this town. So I'm not sure what's gonna happen for the next 14 days. I haven't heard anyone argue based on the current positivity rate and case count um, going up that it's somehow going to change. But we are only on August 18th, we have 27 cases. For perspective, in Holliston, in August 2020, and again, all of this information is available on the Town of Holliston website. So going into last school year, uh, we had a total of 13 cases for the entire month of August. So I think that's important for people um, to reflect on as we continue this discussion. Again, just to get the number correct, I have, and, and Keith and Susan, correct me if I'm wrong, 166 positive COVID cases in our school between staff and students for last school year. And that's when we were wearing masks. And for most of the year, we were distanced at six feet. Sorry. Ah, sorry, Lisa, I'm sorry I skipped over you and then the cabin. That's okay. That's okay. Um, I had a couple of questions and then a couple of comments. Um, what about, we, we specify that face masks are not required during supervised mask breaks, eating, drinking, outdoor recess, during physical education classes um, outside, but they're also, when kids are outside at the middle school or high school, they also wouldn't be required to wear masks, correct? So it's basically any time outside. I wonder if we should just say that more explicitly because okay. we say during physical education classes outside, which makes me think there might be other. Well, there could be physical education I, inside, right? Right, but if, and then we say during outdoor recess yep. next, which it yep. just makes it confusing, I think, because I think our intent is that there's no masks outdoors. I think that's the intent of this draft. And just so people at home know <laughs> what we're talking about, this is a draft purport, put forward by the policy subcommittee, which is three members of the school committee, and we are reviewing it tonight. So we're asking our questions and making our comments tonight. So someone mentioned that it was a foregone conclusion. Um, and that's not quite accurate. This is um, a policy that is under discussion tonight, and we are scheduled to vote next week on it. So um, all right, so that was one of my questions. And then I had a second question on the one, two, three, We'll call this the seventh paragraph. It says, after the last bullet points, it says exceptions to this policy under certain circumstances, such as for students with medical behavioral or other challenges who are unable to wear masks must be approved by the building principal in consultation with the school nurse, et cetera. So mm -hmm. it seems a little redundant with the paragraph that's in the middle of the bullets, which says 
they won't, it won't be required for anyone with medical behavioral or other challenges. And you need a written note from your physician. So it's confusing because in one spot, we're saying you need a written note from your physician and the other spot we're saying must be approved by the building principal in consultation with the school nurse. So it's, I think those, I don't have a fix right this second, but it just feels like we need to fix that somehow. It seems kind of redundant and, and a little confusing. I, I, I think I, can you hear me? I'm on two yes. devices. So I, uh, I think I can clarify a little bit why it's in both places. So the, in the first, the paragraph that's under about the individual and the parent having to provide a, an exemption, a physical exemption. So if a parent is saying, for example, my child is medically unable or behaviorally unable to wear a mask, but there's not necessarily evidence from our determinations based on IEPs or different things like that, then the doctor, we would need a medical doctor to make that assessment for us because we're not medical clinicians. So a parent would get the note from the doctor in that case. However, there might be some exceptions in the school building that the teacher slash nurse, um, the administrator might have some anecdotal data and can verify that the child is struggling inside school, even if a medical exemption hasn't been signed by a doctor. So that's why it's in both places is how I would understand it, because it might be a request by a parent and they would have to document the why if we didn't have any evidence of that. Okay, so maybe we could just somehow make that a little bit more clear. Um, I just feel like the way it's written now is confusing. Maybe if we if we put those two bar paragraphs next to each other instead of separating them, um, and then just condensed it a little bit. I don't know the way it, the way it reads now is a little bit confusing. Okay, so then. Um, just, just so you know, that that was largely just that part is all following the guidance policy from MASC. Those, yeah, those but that doesn't mean. That doesn't no, no, mean I'm just letting happen. you know that we're not created. <laughs> okay. We create those. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I just want to make a couple of comments of, about this. I, I certainly lean pretty strongly in favor of this proposed policy from the policy subcommittee and thank you to the policy subcommittee for doing the work on this. Um, I think the, our highest priority is keeping our schools open safely. We don't want to have to go virtual. We don't want large numbers of kids quarantining. And There's I no think, option for virtual, Lisa. Right. But if we're it, it, not now, but if we have to shut down the entire school system, well, because, I don't um, know, I guess that's up to Governor Baker, but he said there is no remote option this year. I, I, I'm looking, I, I am just looking to, I, I think that there's a lot that we don't know. And I You're think right. I just didn't want people to think that a remote option was possible because it is not okay. currently I, at yeah, all. Yes. Okay. What, what I'm referring to is, you know, we don't want to have to shut down the schools. We don't want to have to, um, you know, quarantine large numbers of children. We want children in school and in school safely. And I think that one of the best tools based on the research that we have is masking everyone. And I I struggle with the arguments about rights. I hate wearing a mask, I hate it. And I understand that people don't want to wear it, don't want their children wearing them. I totally get it. But that's a reason, that's not a reason to me for us to not start the school year with all the unknowns we have about the Delta variant, the Delta variant being more contagious, the number of breakthrough cases, the large number of unvaccinated children. This that to me is a reason to revisit this in four to six weeks or whenever we decide, and and see if it's still necessary. But I I think that, you know, they your rights end where someone else's begin, and the idea of having optional masking to me doesn't it doesn't make any sense when you look at that next to the data because the the research that we have tells us that you're wearing a mask more to protect the people around you. So how is, a, how is a child, you know, you send a child off to kindergarten and you want your child to wear a mask 
but half the kids in the classroom, their parents had decided not to mask them. I don't understand how that child is protected. And I think that that, you know, goes against our mission to keep our children safe. I mean, that's fundamental to, you know, everything that we do as a community. I mean, you can't have children aren't learning if they're not safe. Um, and I think it is, so we've alluded to this, but I don't know if we've stated it explicitly. Has, has the Holliston Federation of Teachers, the teachers union um, officially supported this? Yes. Okay. I heard from Jamie Catone specifically today that she said okay. she had a full support for a face mask covering okay. pregnancy. I think that's really important to emphasize. This is also a workplace. And, you know, I think that I can't, I would have been terrified as a teacher to go into the schools at the beginning of the school year last year with all the unknowns. Luckily, you know, we got through the school year without, you know, any significant, you know, really horrible things happening. Um, but I think that protecting our, our teachers and paraprofessionals and all the staff at the schools has to be one of our priorities as well. I understand that parents are, are worried about their children because that's their role. And our role as a school committee is to think of the whole district. We have to think of all the kids at every level. We have to think about all of the staff. And that's why those exceptions are built in there. If you have a child who's having significant issues, if you really feel like your child's learning is being impeded, that's when you talk to your physician and you know see if if your child might be you know a child who needs an ex, uh, to be exempted from this policy. I mean, it doesn't have to be either or. I don't think that, you know, we don't want children, we're not, we're not in the business of, of making it more difficult for children to learn. This is something that I think that we all hope will be very temporary. But right now, all the news about the Delta variant is that it's much more contagious and breakthrough cases have been in children have been pretty scary. And of course, we have a large portion of our school population, everybody 11 and under, who can't be vaccinated yet. Um, and a lot of them have siblings at, at the high school or, or other schools. So I just, I think that, you know, if, if we're going to keep our kids safe, that this is a really important tool um, for us to use to do so. Thanks. Thanks, Lisa. Catherine? I was just wondering, um, we know, or can we know at some point in time, how much of the school staff is vaccinated, the teachers, the pairs, the staff, um, we can sort of figure that out based on the, on, um, the numbers that we get from the, the Board of Health for the students. Um, and obviously we know anyone who's under, you know, basically Miller, anyone at Miller Placentino is not in terms of kids, but is there a way to know that? Um, not specific people, but percentages? Susan, you want to take that? So we don't have that data and it's HIPAA protected. So we can ask the staff to voluntarily tell us that. But if somebody is not vaccinated and chooses not to tell us, we, we wouldn't get accurate data on that. I, I guess on a high end that we could have about 80%. That, that's my guesstimate. And I'm only guessing that we could be higher. But we did allow staff to leave the building last year and help cover their classes so that they could get vaccinated. So a lot of people did submit requests to do so, but, but because it's HIPAA protected, I could certainly send out a survey and ask that information, but we're not gonna get accurate data if they choose to um, not respond to it. All right, okay, thank you. Minnie, did you wanna share something or ask a question? No, I think everything is pretty covered. So um, my only one more, one question probably I have is that, um, our, so there was, there's this kind of letter from the community about masters. This probably would be a question to Susan and Keith and the budget committee is that, is there a way we could find um, like, you know, 
find a way to see if we could provide masks to kids. Um, probably a couple of them, more robust mask, if possible. Um, being that we you know it's something we might be mandating. So it's just a question that came up uh, in a in a in a community member um, email. So uh, I would like to address that as well. Yes, yeah, so I don't have the current numbers of masks that we have on stock. I did ask our nurse leader to see if she could get us an update um, in the next week or so to see what we have still on um, on premises. I will say, though, at the end of the school year when things were getting better, and I, I was asked by Desi, any superintendent that wanted to request additional PPE could do so. So I put in a request to get more KN95 masks, more sanitizer, more of the sterile masks, and when I was sending Keith Boudet or whoever he sent to go pick that up, I was thinking, is this crazy? We, we are going to get materials that we're not going to need. However, unfortunately, we do need them. So we do have a number of KN95 masks as well. Certainly not enough for the school year, but we have enough to get started. And then we can address it later if we need to supply more. Staff were offered last year and will be again if they need KN95. They just request those from the office as well and we give five at a time and they go for five weeks. They get one for each day and we would do so similarly with students. Wonderful, thank you. John, go ahead. And for those that are, are watching now but may not have been tuned into the June meeting or didn't catch the policy meeting, um, Dr. Kreska, what is your recommendation and why on this policy? You know, just seeing everything that's happening over the last few weeks and the increases, and I have people that work in the medical profession. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a new grandmother with a baby at my grandchild at home. I have a 91-year-old mother-in-law. I listen to all staff, all students. I, I feel like I need to represent everyone in the community, in our school community. I'm here for, I, you know, I, I'm the leader of the staff and the students. And with all these unknowns, my recommendation is solidly to have the school year start pre-K to 12 with everyone being masked. I have to listen to the needs of our staff and students. Certainly, no one wants to see kids masked. We all want to see them having um, the ability to have their social emotional learning that takes place in addition to their academic learning. And no one thinks this is ideal. But until we get a handle on getting the kids back to school and find out if the transmission is going to start to transmit in school environments as well, it is my recommended recommendation that we start this way. And I would suggest within a month, as I think Lisa may have said, four to six weeks to look at that again. I think two weeks might be a little bit soon, but it, you know, at least a month of two to six weeks of data would give us some information to help us assess whether we can lighten up the restrictions a little bit. Um, I just wanted to say that um, I did speak to Chief Cassidy about discussing metrics and um, as to you know when we could rescind it, when we could revise it. And he didn't really have an answer either because he feels like it's just too, he's not really in a position right now to figure out what those metrics would be um, because it's an evolving situation. What, um, what we did discuss in a meeting was, you know, we don't even have emergency use authorization for ages five through 11, but that is should be coming in the next many weeks, but it could be in like three or four weeks. Um, and then I think that at that time we could see what uh, the vaccination rates, because vaccination rates are very high in Holliston, and that's great, but we are already seeing breakthrough infections in Holliston. And it's not, and, and, I, and the vaccines are effective at preventing hospitalization and death. What they won't prevent is if we have eight people, eight teachers, for example, sick at the high school, that's an entire department. And that means that you know a substitute, if we can find one, is teaching AP physics. And I just don't think that's you know what we want for our, our students and for our staff either. Um, I think there's also precedent in our district to have policies that protect um, children that may be marginalized or maybe in a smaller minority. Like, let's just take our policy about life-threatening allergies, um, particularly to things like nuts. We used to sell peanut butter and jelly sandwiches in the cafeteria. We stopped doing that. 
um, because we had, you know, what, uh, roughly 150 kids with life-threatening food allergies that we needed to address. And now we have all these procedures around making sure we can keep those kids safe while they're in the lunchroom and still with their peers. We don't put them on a separate table away from everybody they eat and they have a buffer zone. And we have all these procedures around that to make sure our kids can be included um, as and participate in lunch just like their peers. So um, <clears throat> those are my two cents. Um, that being said, I do think that it'd be great if we could decide to um, in a later date, maybe in the next, as Dr. Kuska says, to um, put a date for us to discuss it again. We only have a meeting a month um, in the fall, so it would be maybe our November meeting then, because I think our October one is sort of early in the October timeframe, is it not? Let me just double check. It is. Right. We've been known to have more than one meeting a month. That's absolutely true. I just saying that what we had had <laughs> more than one meeting. How about many meetings a week? Um, so I'm just saying, well, there are other ones because we don't, you know, there's sometimes there's holidays and other things as well. So we could um, put that as tentatively on that agenda to for us to look at and discuss. Maybe Chief Cassidy could join us and give us some thoughts. I don't know what anybody thinks about that, but just that's my two cents. Amanda, I'm sorry, you can go ahead now. So, no, that's okay, this is just a quick thing. Um, so, um, since we do have a precedent of um, making sure all small groups, um, I wanna, again, not to beat a dead horse, but to revisit the um, second language learners and kids who have um, any kind of hearing loss. Um, I see a, there is, so we put a sentence in the, um, the policy document um, unvaccinated individuals must remain at least three feet of distance inside when unmasked, right? For students being able to eat inside, um, things of that nature. And I understand that the thinking behind that is because we don't want someone to have to uh, quarantine. Um, and so we're gonna go within those parameters of the CDC. Could a, under that sentence, could a teacher who is in the front of the room at least three feet away from every single student, if that teacher is vaccinated, could they remove their mask? That's my question. So uh, Amanda, does or just with the kids that are special needs or they have some kind of a disability with hearing or ESL. Is that what you're asking? I mean, I would assume that a majority of classes, if not all, have someone for whom English is not their first language or someone for, for whom they have a slight or more hearing disability. So I'm talking universally if that teacher is vaccinated. Um, I've spoken with many teachers as well, and um, a few have voiced concerns about speaking extra loudly with a mask, even vocal cord issues. Um, and I'm wondering if it's, we're asking teachers to use their, um, their discretion. And I know that can sometimes be a gray area that we don't wanna enter in on, but I'm wondering if that sentence in the document would cover such a thing. So just to chime in here, that that is uh, because I work extensively with um, kids who are who have English as a second language, and as well as kids. Um, I actually have two kids with um, hearing loss, uh, like hearing aid right now. So they bring in a like a speaker that you have to press when you're talking to them. So what we do is that we use a mask that has a plastic pole in, in the middle, so they can lip read. That is, an, that is an option you guys might want to explore because um, even those kids who have the hearing um, issue, like, uh, like for example, my business, I mandate mask. But even then with the, with the parents, they send in their kids the mask. And um, so these two kids are also masked, but they can uh, like lip read through that. So if that is something you, know, you want to explore. 
Yeah, we did discuss clear mask last night, Minnie. So thank you for bringing that up. And um, the school nurse has um, said that she is going to check to see what supplies they had. They had some last year. And so um, that is being looked into. Catherine? Um, but I think Amanda brings up a good point, which is if what we have written is that if someone is unvaccinated and unmasked and three feet or less away from a person, right? That's sort of like the, the line that we're drawing as the person who then needs to quarantine or, or whatever the protocols may be. And I don't think we exactly know what all of those are yet, but that seems to be the line that's being drawn. So if we have for indoors, so if we have a teacher who is vaccinated, unmasked and 10 feet away, would that be allowed? Could that be allowed? Go ahead, Dawn. Susan, do you understand, like, do you, could you tell us about what the implications for quarantining would be? I guess, because I know there were some new guessing regs that came out the previous um, Friday, August 13th, that, uh, that, that talked to that as well, but you're also looking for clarification on it. But in what they just proposed, the 10 feet um, unmasked with a vaccinated uh, teacher. How would that work? So a couple of issues that I am trying to think of in the phrase is that, you know, people are asking if we can ask if teachers are vaccinated. Yes, we can ask, but they don't have to tell us, right? So how will I know if the teacher that's unmasked in the building is also unvaccinated? And... Right now, they're not suggesting distance is, is the issue with the unmasked piece. And what about the teacher who does not feel comfortable but has special needs students or students with disabilities that would be benefit, would all benefit from having someone without a mask on? But if the teacher doesn't feel safe, so that would have to be impact bargained as well because now you have an equity issue that some teachers might do it voluntarily, some might not. We would have to bargain that for sure because not everybody would feel safe to do so. But we do provide, um, for teachers, we can provide the microphones and some teachers have amplifiers for some of their students that have audio um, concerns. Keith, we have them, we actually bought more last year, didn't we? We, we put them in a lot more rooms. Yeah, there, there are a number of classrooms that are permanently outfitted with an FM system. And, um, you know, we, we haven't struggled with this in the past. Um, not that this isn't a new situation, obviously, but, you know, and if we needed to, I certainly have funds that would allow us to increase our, our inventory of those. So. I just don't know if we could guarantee 10 feet of distance from the kids, you know, maybe in a corner of a room, but then are they getting further and further away from kids? So are you not impacting their ability to hear because of too far away? Not all the classrooms would be able to get you 10 feet away from the front of the, the students in the front of the classroom. Right, because we're not even gonna have three feet necessarily of distance between students because distancing was not a requirement this year at all. Right, and last year when we took out half the kids and had half the desks in the classroom and put kids into two rooms, our teachers, we guarantee that they could be six feet. If we put them in a, had their cart in a corner, we guaranteed at least six feet. I can't even think of a room that would allow 10 feet, but, um, six feet was even a challenge and that was with half the kids in the class. Okay. Yeah, I didn't say 10 feet. I'm, I guess I'm, I guess what you're, you're answering my question in that, like I'm talking about teacher discretion and wiggle room, right? And Dr. Cusca, you're saying, well, we would need to bargain and make it part of an MOA, um, which is a good point because of equity. And like, so I'm saying like, certainly teachers don't have to do this. And if a teacher doesn't feel comfortable ever removing his or her mask, they should not. They, they don't have to. Um, I guess I'm talking like if, if I'm explaining a complicated calculus lesson, I know I have five second language learners here. Can I remove my mask if I'm sure everyone's away or will I get in trouble for that? I just want to clarify that I was the one who said 10 feet and I was just sort of throwing that out as a hypothetical, but I guess I meant it more as like, we need to examine the other side of the line too. Like if we've drawn this line that says unmasked, unvaccinated three feet, 
and someone has taken their mask off and they're like, but I'm vaccinated and I'm 10 feet, then can I take my mask off? Like that's the other, you know, it, we have to talk about that side of it too. Not, not that I'm ins insinuating that we should make teachers do that, but like there's the other side of some people want to take their mask off and so can they. I would say the way it's written, the answer would be no. Go ahead, Don. And that's why I think we should be flexible and responsive. I think this also needs to be collaborative. I think we need to further discuss just exactly that issue. And I know you're on negotiating now too, Amanda, but we should be continuing this discussion with the HFT, with the Paris, um, finding out if there's an appetite to survey this, how it's going to impact teachers and, and all staff um, and continuing to have that discussion. But I would say, it doesn't need to be stagnant. We can revisit these things. In fact, I don't. I would not recommend that we enact this and think that we're going to have this until mid-June. I would like to revisit revisit this at the end of September, early October. That would be my ask. There was just one other follow-up I had, and that is, this goes to Dr. Kuska and Keith. Just walk us through a sixth grader who has six or seven different classes. And I know you're you're very familiar with the layout of our middle school and how close those desks are going to be, whether we have 17 in a room or 26 in a room. But an average unvaccinated six year old, uh, sixth grader um, rotating through six or seven different classes, going to lunch um, is positive. How many kids are going to go into quarantine or be part of the test to stay program? Just so that goes back to the way it's written now for unvaccinated students. If they were unmasked and less than three feet, they would have to quarantine. That's how I understand it. If they were unmasked, let's say for lunch, but that they, they were at least at three feet and they are asymptomatic, then they could test and stay. That is my understanding. And if you're vaccinated, you know, it changed. You have, you have even the vaccinated students that are, that are older, if they were less than three feet while well, they were unmasked, but they're vaccinated, they also can do test and stay if they're asymptomatic. So the criteria changed a little bit for unvaccinated students. And, and you're right, it's going to be very hard to do this contact tracing. And that's why we will have to maintain the three foot distancing for students when they're within um, lunch period for the kids that are sixth grade and under. They will have to have three foot distance at lunch and three foot distance at mass breaks inside. If you're vaccinated, which is most of our older students, they wouldn't necessarily have to have that three foot distance. Minnie and then Lisa. So uh, do we have any data on the effectiveness of the plastic shields if at a distance? The ones that you wear this way, like with a band? I, I don't know the effectiveness overall. I know it's less effective than the mask, but it provides more protection than a, it is really only used for a small number of students that cannot wear a mask um, for medical reasons or for um, behavioral reasons. So I don't know the data on that, but it's certainly not as effective as a mask, but it's more effective than no mask. So uh, I was asking if the teachers could use that as, a, as an option if they're vaccinated and are at a distance. So if there's a data and if that is something we could consider. Teachers already, yes, they are, they, we supply those to teachers. Many of the teachers that were using them last year were using them in addition to masks. I don't know if we had any teachers that were wearing them in lieu of masks. I can't recall that, but um, teachers could have a medical exemption as well. But if you're asking if we want to change the policy to make something like that part of the policy, that would be a suggestion that you would want to make. Sorry, Lisa? Thanks. So if I just understood you correctly, Dr. Kuska, if, if someone is vaccinated, if a child is vaccinated, well, if anyone is vaccinated and exposed to someone with COVID, they'll still be allowed to stay in school? If, if they're asymptomatic, but they were considered a close contact, 
they would be allowed to stay in school if we're doing the test and stay and monitoring their um, for at least five days they would have to be tested. School testing is also applicable now called more um, diagnostic safety testing. Those are also options that we have. We just got the guidance on that on Friday and still a lot of confusion around it, but the nurses are looking into it. There are multiple meetings that are taking place. We don't have that in place yet. I'm applying for those procedures as well. But if you read the guidance on the test and say, anyone unvaccinated that was unmasked and less than three feet did not do test and stay. So those are the kids that I would be worried about would then have to quarantine if we can't keep that three foot distance. So I, I really need us to ensure the three foot distance for unmasked students that are unvaccinated, which is our 12 and under population at lunch inside. Yeah, so it may, that makes me wor a little bit worried about RAMs where you're going to have a lot of sixth graders who aren't vaccinated, who can't be vaccinated yet because of their age, mixing with other sixth graders who are vaccinated, um, again, because of their age. And I could see a real problem with allowing, you know, kids who are vaccinated but have been exposed to stay in that population. Um, I mean, I don't know what the solution is. It's not necessarily, I don't know what the solution is, but it, so you're saying that if someone is a close contact and vaccinated, they're gonna be allowed to stay at school, but they have to do, is it the Binax test? They'll have to do a rapid test every day for five days? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think that, I, I think, it, it's, I think it's a little bit different where your sixth grade is going to be a special case because you're going to have a bunch of kids who are, can't be vaccinated yet because of their age, and then you're going to have a portion of kids who can be vaccinated because they're 12 and up. Um, I feel like that's going to be a little trickier than maybe some other grade levels where, I don't know, I have to, I'd have to think through that, but that seems kind of problematic at, at Rams at least. So if my memory is correct, when I taught sixth grade, our sixth grade population are 11 and 12. And the majority of them would be still 11 starting the school year. You'd have very few turning 12 early in the year or, you know, because they have to be, is it August 31st is when the cutoff is for kindergartners. So if they came in as a yeah, kindergartner. Yeah, I know. We're, we're a town that holds. Well, we're a town that holds a lot of a lot of parents send their kids, especially boys, get sent late. <laughs> and so you're you're going to have, I mean, I don't know what the numbers are, but you're going to have, you know, a, a certain number of kids that are already twelve. Um, okay, I'll I'll hold my questions for about that for later. Okay, so um, I think that at this point we have a lot to uh, to work on still with the policy. So. Uh, maybe the policy subcommittee could, you know, get together again to review over some of the questions and comments that they received tonight and, um, you know, revisit it, and then we can talk about it again next time. Does that sound okay? Okay. All right. So I'm going to move on to the next item on our agenda. Um, I don't know if we have any reports from communications. No. Also, we just uh, oh, do we have something from communications? I'm sorry. Yeah, so this was just, I had talked to Dr. Kuska today, and I just wanted to um, propose that we come up with a newsletter for um, next Thursday. Okay. That would, and communications is not my committee. Dawn is the chair, but um, so that's why I'm, I'm bringing it up. I, I'd like to come up with um, a way in our newsletter to discuss the fake website and the CRT and kind of respond to that a little bit. I know it's tricky, um, but Dr. Kuska and I had talked about it today because the backstory on this is that Amanda and I, as liaisons with Diverse Halston, met with some of the administrators in Diverse Halston last week, and we discussed putting together an FAQs to cover some of these topics that are out there, CRT and, you know, is curriculum changing and CRT is not part of mass framework, all that stuff. We propose putting together frequently asked questions. 
But in talking with Dr. Kuska, I think it's going to make more sense to do something that is part of our newsletter. So if we're going to do a newsletter next week, um, we just wanted to think about that a little bit openly in this meeting because it's going to be something we all have to think about. I'm okay with taking up part of the newsletter, but I think I'm going to need help on some of the other pieces. I think that we're going to want to announce a few other things in the newsletter, some of the new hires, new positions, and so forth. I mean, some of this, I think normally we would wait to the beginning of the school year, but I think that we have to start working on this stuff because there's just so much um, going on. We thought we were going to skate through summer with, you know, kind of peacefully, and that has not happened. So I just kind of wanted to throw that out there so you guys aren't surprised if you hear from, I don't know, either myself or Dawn about um, communications next week. Um, and I particularly wanted to address the, the issues on the fake website and CRT because I had communicated to all of you that we were going to do an FAQs. And after talking to Dr. Kuska, I do think it it's going to work better and go a little bit more smoothly if we if we do it in a newsletter format. So I just wanted to throw that out there. We don't necessarily need to discuss it right now unless people have questions or concerns. Um, but that's a little bit of a communications update. Okay. I guess I would just prefer that we don't get it an hour before the meeting. <laughs> um, I will do it. <laughs> I'm going to need help writing some other sections of it. Sure. Like, yeah. for example, does somebody want to volunteer to write you know, write up, do a little write up about um, our new assistant superintendent. I think we, you know, could do a little write up about Jerry L because he just introduced himself tonight. That would be appropriate, but we haven't really introduced, you know, and welcomed Joni. I don't think with the newsletter. So I think we would want to do both of those at the same time. To who wants to volunteer to help with the newsletter? So okay, so just to backtrack a little bit. Um, I don't know, and I, I don't need to put um, Dr. Kuska on a, um, in a on a spot here, but um, typically we do a community newsletter during the summer, and I didn't know whether or not Dr. Kuska was planning to do a community newsletter. And in the community newsletter, we could do things like introducing Joni and Jerry L and other people so that we could take that off of our plate, or no? I'm sorry, am I putting you on the spot? So it has, it has been my intention, and I've been working with the central office team, that we were going to put together a template to send out through Bright Arrow with not just superintendent updates, but curriculum updates, you know, different departments at central office. Just, truth be told, though, all of this has hit, hit the fan lately, and I'm yeah. not sure. Okay. Set that out in top of the so there's, there is an intent, but, you know, given the more communication that's going to happen that I was hoping would be reduced. We may not get there um, before school opens, but we will be doing it. Hopefully. <laughs> Soon. Okay. I don't want to make promises, but I can't. Sure, I get it. I get it. Okay. Yeah, that was before. I think we had talked about it before all of this started happening a couple of weeks ago. So, um, okay. So, sounds good. Minnie? Lisa, um, I should be able to help you, uh, but depending on when do you need it? So we should really try to get it done probably early next week, maybe Monday or Tuesday, so that everyone has a chance to look at it. Um, who else is on communication subcommittee? It's myself and Dawn, and who else? Are you asking me? <laughs> I don't know who else is on the communication subcommittee. Uh, I can't remember. <laughs> okay, yeah, I should be able to help with that. It's okay. Uh, yeah, I think we no, all need to have You a don't have that. to be on the subcommittee to help with the newsletter, but no, but I do think that's on it. Can... Isn't Minnie on it? I don't know. I can't find that right the second. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. That's fine. So I'll be, I guess I'll, we'll have to think through this and reach out to people and get some kind of draft going before. I haven't even talked to Diverse Holliston about this yet because the way we left it with them was we were going to work with them on some FAQs. Um, so, Amanda, I'll probably enlist your help um, in writing up some of this just in line with what we had already said we were going to do. But I don't know. I just I feel like we need to... So much has happened this summer. I really thought it was going to be a quiet summer. And suddenly I'm feeling like, you know, we're there's a lot of communications that 
that need to happen sooner rather than later, it feels like, unfortunately. Okay. Um, let's see, we already did policy. We don't have any budget update yet. Do we have a meeting date for budget? I do, we don't have a meeting date yet, but okay. I need to do that like tomorrow morning. Okay. Um, superintendent's evaluation. Dawn, do you want to give a quick update on that? Yes, we had, and so again, this is the evaluation from 2021. Yep. Um, so it did include outreach to some of the prior members. We had collected um, the individual uh, comments and responses and compiled them and um, did have a meeting this week and met with Dr. Kuska and reviewed it, um, reviewed the assessment. Awesome. All right, great. Thank you. All right, so we'll move on to old business. We've got superintendent's COVID update. Dr. Kuska? We're still working through all the kinks, as you know, with all the recent changes. So we'll be giving more updates next week as we get closer to reopening. I wish I, um, you know, we were starting on a more positive note, but I'm still very optimistic about the school year to come. We're gonna make this work for our students and staff. There might be some adjustments as we go along to some of our safety protocols. We will be updating all of our uh, flow charts to explain that whole testing protocol. We still have to apply for that. We still have to get that up and running. I don't think that's gonna happen overnight. You know, hopefully before school year starts, I'll at least have an idea of when it will start. Um, but those flow charts are gonna have to be updated to reflect all these changes, changes related to distance and things that no longer apply. And I, our nurse leader and other nurses are gonna be working on those in the next few days. So there'll be information coming out next, early next week and later next week. And hopefully people won't be inundated with too much communication. But as soon as I have changes to, that are related to any protocols, I get those out in a timely manner. Okay. Right. All right. So I'll move on to uh, new business. It says fall opening plans. That may be kind of redundant with the uh, superintendent's COVID update, but, and Keith, you already spoke about the turf. Um, any other opening plans? Nope. Okay. So now we, I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead, Amanda. Sorry. Um, I don't think this I know I interrupt you. I don't think this is the time or place, but um, we talked a lot about masking. But will we be having another policy committee to talk about other COVID related issues, um, such as like, will there be assemblies? Um, will we observe snow days or will they have a remote option? Like stuff like that. Are those things I should be asking you to put on the agenda for next week? Hey. It, there is no remote option. Is that correct? So, sure. so correct. it's not so, like the authority to have it'll a remote just be an update. Assembly, yeah. distancing, cafeteria protocols. Yeah, but the, yeah, but those will just end up being that guidance. Those will be procedures and not necessarily a policy that we have in place. So, okay. Um, no newsletter this week. Okay, so I do have a bunch of warrants that I did um, sign on behalf of the committee, um, but I did not write them down. But thankfully, Mr. Boudet has got me covered. So he is going to tell you the, what, 13 different warrants that I signed. These were from like cumul cumulative over the summer. So, so bear with him in the list. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Boudet. Um, uh, I have a school bill warrant in the amount of $23,388.77. Another school bill warrant in the amount of $26,652.56. A school bill warrant in the amount of $317,504.34. Um, a school bill warrant in the amount of $33,671.94. School bill warrant in the amount of $1,768.90. School bill warrant in the amount of $79,720.64. School bill warrant in the amount of $41,657.47. School bill warrant in the amount of $108,272.74. A school bill warrant in the amount of $81,469.37. 
a school bill warrant in the amount of $194,464.72, a school bill warrant in the amount of $118,455.23, a cafeteria bill warrant in the amount of $6,646.55, a cafeteria bill warrant in the amount of $8,401.52. A student activity replenishment uh, request for Holliston High School in the amount of $8,662.06. And a student activity replenishment request for Adams Middle School in the amount of $886.93. That is it for tonight. You. <laughs> Thank you very much for reading all those numbers. I would have stumbled over all of them. Okay, um, I have no other items of information. Our next meeting is Thursday, August 26th at 7 p.m. And I will welcome a motion to adjourn. Moved by Don. Second. By Moved by Don, seconded by Amanda. Roll call vote. Ms. Gupta? Yes. Ms. Naborski? Yes. Ms. Koshin? Yes. Ms. Bigelow? Yes. Dr. Savard? Yes. And Mrs. Lestevnik, yes. Thank you everyone for joining us this evening. We'll see you next week. <laughs>